Welcome to It May Interest You to Know, Tony Marcolini. I'm joined by my co-host, Seamus McDonough. And today we have a, another special guest. Uh, uh, you'll know him as an executive producer on some major projects uh, with uh, Bon Jovi and 50 Cent uh, and uh, Chris Angel. Uh, I mean, the list is endless I have here. I, I probably can't get all of them into the introduction, but we hope to get to as many of them as we can during today's uh, interview. So please, everybody, welcome for me, Michael Bloom. Hi, Michael. Good morning. <laughs> Thank Good you for being here. here. Pleasure to be here with you. So okay. Seamus Sheamus and I were, you know, arguing before when you went on about which project we thought was the most exciting that you had done. <laughs> I think we both saw two different projects as being the most exciting, but uh, I think I'd like to start, if I could, with the Bon Jovi projects. Uh, the Bon Jovi projects were interesting in that um, uh, one of the challenges with uh, the Bon Jovi band is a, it's a legacy band from the 80s. And they wanted to, and has managed to keep alive in hits in every decade. And is tri-generational. You go to his concerts, grandma's there, the daughter's there, <laughs> the granddaughter's there. <laughs> I mean, it's really an interesting thing that he's evolved. He let his hair go full gray. And I was involved. His brother um, uh, is his video director. And... In essence, the video guy that for the people in the uh, not front row that are looking at the giant screens, in a way, that video director is a member of the band. He is actually there on the side of the stage editing in the effects and then and, and the close-up of Richie Sambora on his guitar. And in a way, he's like a musician because he has to cut you know, and know the show. He's got to know when the drum fills are. He's got to know where to go. And um, all of those video screens at times would require like music videos to play behind John, big effects. And that's what I was got involved with them first producing was these background roll-in features that would play at concerts all over the world and that he would get in the way of singing in front of so that I could pretend that the audience was all screaming for my work and the guy shaking his tail up there had nothing to do with it. Um, <laughs> and it was a very interesting experience. Over 10 years, three tours, um, did some work for Bon Jovi TV, which is when he got into online digital, um, just, you know, different things. You'd be amazed at how many promotional video related things the band needs outside of regular music videos. I wasn't the producer for his regular music videos, but all the, uh, a lot of the concert stuff. And, uh, mm -hmm. and what was great about that is I didn't have to go on tour and live on a stinky tour bus with a bunch of people who smoke a lot of cigarettes and, you know, haven't bathed in a while. Um, I could just go into the show and say, oh, it's working. <laughs> you know? And it was a challenge. You know, it's like we did one thing. There's a famous song, Bad Medicine, and came up with the idea that um, we shot these uh, basically stripper notices uh, or what looked like stripper notices against the green screen. And what the front row didn't know is that during Bad Medicine, we projected them dancing onto the audience, like onto the, the, the main floor audience was the screen. And so mm -hmm. the people in the cheap seats could all see these stripper nurses, but the people on the floor, they didn't know what they were cheering. <laughs> so you have to be creative with the effects and oh. you know, getting the band on or getting them off the stage. If you want to do something theatrical, how do they appear? How do they leave? You know, and, and when you're John Bon Jovi, your competition is you 2 and the Rolling Stones and Paul McCartney and other, you know, huge multi-million dollar touring acts that require 18, 18 wheelers. And, um, mm -hmm. but that's your, that's your standard. That's your company. Oh, what did Bono do? You know, what the, you know, what did Paul McCartney do? And, mm -hmm. and then of course, other tours as they get bigger, but these are legacy stadium acts. Is it intimidating then for that reason? Were you a little, a little intimidated going into it? No, because it's weird. I'm from New Jersey. They were all from New Jersey. His brother and I are very close and, and is a great guy. And he ran a great organization. And he had been through his rock and roll age days. Now he was running a multi-million dollar corporation. And, you know, mm. he's a huge football fan. And his goal was to, he wanted to buy the New York Giants. So anytime that anybody came, not that he was going to be able to, but Anytime somebody came to him and needed more money for something, he says, do you know how expensive an NFL team is? <laughs> <laughs> I 
as if I should have sympathy that he can't get one. <laughs> but uh, so, but it was a good work experience, you know. And um, I had worked in rock and roll before. I had spent my whole college career putting on concerts and bringing acts to campus. And then the local promoter in Chicago, they said that they could either kill me or hire me. Uh, and that's how they deal with competition there. And I wound up working at. 12 different venues of different sizes for every tour that went through Chicago from 79 to 82. So I got to mm. see all my heroes. I mean, Stone shows at backstage, Sinatra, all of it. Wow. And, and I was a kid. I was 20 something years old and, and I was in heaven. <laughs> I was living my rock and roll dream. So, I mean, I guess you have a passion for music. I play. I'm actually a keyboard player. It's what I do um, in my off time, so to speak. Um, I'm told I play as well as some people who consider themselves pros. I met Herbie Hancock. I know I'm not even close. So I stayed <laughs> down for Chikoria. I've, I've, I've met some of my piano heroes, Keith Jarrett um, and Oscar Peterson. And I just, there's just so many great, great players. I just play. I, I do it for love. Lessons, uh, like you had lessons from when you were a kid, the whole nine yards? Yes, no. I, um, I came home from... Oliver the musical with my parents and there was a toy Melodia sitting on the floor and I started playing the music from Oliver. So they immediately knew I had an ear. And I took two years of classical but hated it. I wanted to jazz it up. And, but I always played ever since I could reach. And, and I found out, I heard a story online. It was interesting. There's a famous bass player who's played as far back as Miles Davis. And he is considered among bass players probably one of the top five in the world. And they asked him how he started. And he told the same story that I do, that his parents had an acrosonic spinet piano, which means it had a little lid that you could pull out. And I started playing this the moment I could reach between the damper pedal, the sustain pedal, and I could put the lid over to just the tips of the black keys were coming, come sticking out. <laughs> and I knew that if I played the black keys only, that I could play an E flat minor, which is five flats, but there are no bad notes. You're always hitting the right note. And mm -hmm. if you use the sustain pedal, you can make up song. And Marcus Miller told the same story that that's how he started. The difference is that he became one of the most incredible musician bass players in the world. And <laughs> I just still play in my jam studio for love and play out at local dive bars and parties and things. And, <laughs> and produce some monumental work. <laughs> I wouldn't call it monumental. It's really funny. I was at I had a party here once and um, they brought over a nice young lady to meet me and I overheard the conversation. They're like, they said, well, what does he do? And they said, he's a mid-level cable producer. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my lower third, mid-level cable TV producer. But, you know, fortunately, you know, TV for some people, um, you know, that can mean having the same parking spot in the same office overlooking the corner lot at Warner's and, having the same coffee brought to you and the same lunch in the same commissary and you can do it for 20 years. I got kind of lucky because TV sent me all over the world. Mm. I, I, I've made more money outside of Los Angeles producing in places from, I, I worked in Miami, New York, Los Angeles, uh, uh, Las Vegas. And then I lived literally in Singapore, uh, setting up studios and shows in languages I don't speak in uh, Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur and Jakarta, Indonesia. And that was probably one of the more challenging assignments ever to be a fish out of water go to a whole new country you've never been to three new countries really and mm -hmm. working with the locals and the government and uh investors it was a 20th century fox pinkus warburg investment with utv the largest um production company out of india i was working with zoroastrians uh who are called the jews of india uh, I was working with Malay, who are all uh, Muslim. I was working with Tamils, who are Tamil Indians that are, um, there's a population in Singapore, but more of them are in Sri Lanka uh, and India. Um, and then of course the Chinese. And it was interesting working in a tricultural society, multilingual uh, programming, having to be uh, wanting them wanting a uh, comedy like a, their own Seinfeld, but you had to kind of take in their cultural uh, rules and, and norms. And uh, that was a real interesting assignment, I will say. And we were successful at it. We launched three studios and 
our kids show won two TV Asia awards and we did get a Malay sitcom on the air. It became the second highest rated show after telenovelas or something. It was really uh, uh, quite unique, you know, to be an expat and, uh, uh, and live and work in Asia. So I did that for almost three years. Wow. Yeah. And, and you stepped, kind of stepped into my genre, which is boxing. He's a former professional boxer. And yep. you worked with Thunder. My yeah, I, I, I had the opportunity uh, to be, uh, for Showtime, uh, to go with Don King to Beijing. Um, it, it was billed as the brawl at the wall. I called <laughs> it ka -ching in Beijing. <laughs> um, <laughs> the deal was that the Chinese government uh, was looking to bid for the Olympics for Beijing. Uh, and... What Don King did was he convinced me, he said, you guys should really put on a world-class, world-known title fight, fight sporting event to show the world that you can put this on and it'll help you in your Olympic bid. Mm -hmm. So he sold them this whole thing and he brought over Evander and a uh, great undercard. Um, oh, God, what was the guy's name? But he, I remember that he was uh, managed by Sam Simon, who had made all his money off of The Simpsons. Ruiz? That, yeah, Sam Simon. I think Ruiz uh, was the was the you know, father. Getz uh, was the guy that invented it. And then Sam Simon. Uh, anyway, the guy retired and bought a boxing team. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he brought over his boxing team with him. And um, it was, it, Beijing was a mess. I mean, it was literally, you couldn't cross the street. There was so much construction and them trying to get it ready to, you know, be the Olympic city and whatnot. And um, we had an issue with a, um, uh, they decided that we might black out all of Beijing and wanted a backup generator. And we had to get a Jenny that was shipped literally in, you know, down to the wire seconds uh, to back up in case we blacked out the entire city with our uh, electronics. Then they didn't want us to do our uh, uplink downlink and they were at 55 Hertz and we were at, 60 cycles and they didn't want to match them and they wanted us to use their equipment and we couldn't. I mean, it was a mess really mm. until uh, Ruiz apparently pulled his back muscle <sighs> and they literally canceled this fight like the night before. Wow. And it was a mess. <laughs> um, so I had to deproduce this show, which, you know, uh, they, they thought that Don King wasn't going to pay his bills so that all the crew members were told they were paying for their hotel rooms, had to assuage, you know, 50 people. Getting the uh, gear, uh, I was given the uh, mandate, do not leave China until all the gear is gone. So I was literally out on the tarmac at Beijing Airport counting cases <laughs> and bribing, bribing people with uh, Marlboro Red cigarettes <laughs> trying to get this gear you know, back to America. Because we were worried at the time that the Chinese had sent back our plane. They had a spy plane of ours and they promised they would bring it, send it back. But they sent it back piece by piece. Yes. And that's what we were worried. They were telling us, well, we'll send your gear back. <laughs> you know, knob by knob. So, yeah. So that was a, an experience, actually, a boxing one that didn't happen. They did another one in um, uh Burma, Myanmar, where it was a traditional annual bare knuckle Muay Thai title fight. Mm. And I was with a guy named Master Tati, and Master Tati is the Muhammad Ali of Thailand. He is the Muay Thai guy, mm. but he's basically a guy, you know, he's Ali. We, yeah. we, got, off, we got off the plane at two o'clock in the morning. We were greeted by not one, but two different bands. The diplomats took all our passports and luggage. We never even went through customs or immigration. We literally were whisked to the hotel and magically our bags were there with our passports before we were. I mean, that's the level that this guy, you know, operates on. Mm. And, um, so he hosted the, uh, the title fight and we were over there and that was quite an experience as well. Um, and I did something close to it actually with basketball. There was a basketball uh, player strike. This was back in mm. Oregon, where all of the basketball players were free agents. And Shaquille O'Neal's manager was also Akeem Olajuwon's manager. Mm. And Shaquille was the big guy, young guy, you know, seven-foot monster. And Hakeem was older. He was like 30s, but he was the highest outside shooter. 
And they mm. came up with this idea of doing a one-on-one -on -one basketball tournament mm. between Shaquille and Akeem in Atlantic City at Trump's Taj Mahal at $100,000 a round to charity for a million dollars. Ten rounds, one-on-one -on -one basketball, Hack versus Shaq. And then we got Spike Lee to oh. do all the wraparounds and, and, and all of this was uh, to a rock and roll lighting and you know, it was going to be a major, major, and a gambling event to boot. Yeah, mm. both like millions and millions and millions of dollars. Same thing happened as with the Don King thing. Hakeem Olajuwon, two nights before, hurt his back and, <laughs> back and backed out. And we had to deproduce that one. Wow. And if you ever want to see Donald Trump angry when he's losing $3 million, that was a scene you could hear him, like Don King, you could hear these guys through the floors. You know, and uh, so that was an interesting, uh, they aired, it's funny, they aired all on Showtime, all the lead up stuff we had done. We'd done a pre-show, we had done all these, you know, uh, promo spots and all these things, but we never got to air the event because it didn't happen. Wow. Yeah. Oh, it's kind of raining on you for the sports thing. <laughs> yeah, some of my, some of my biggest <laughs> didn't even occur, but they were the most work. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But it's funny, I've developed sort of a weird um, uh, reputation. There are game show producers that do game. There are reality show producers that do reality. There are competition show producers, you know, and et cetera. Normally, if, if you've got a project and it doesn't fit any of the boxes and it's just out there, I'm probably the guy they call. I'm the right oh. guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, Okay, I like that. So I have to ask you about... Uh, you produced for the BET Network uh, the 50 Cent Show. You're one of the executive producers on that. Yes? Yes. Yes. Uh, it's not Tell ongoing. Um, you know, 50 is, is really a very, very talented, diverse uh, guy with a lot of different interests. And we noted, uh, my partner and I noted, that um, uh, there was really no urban comedy that had taken over where In Living Color left off. Key and Peele sort of had, there was no Black Saturday Night Live, in other words. And mm -hmm. we thought there might be an opportunity to create something that would resonate within that community, et cetera. And we had originally, um, uh, 50 loves comedy, loves Chappelle. And in the same way that Chappelle loved music and would put musicians on, 50 wanted to be a musician that put on comics. Mm -hmm. And we were able to convince, um, at the time, actually, we were pitching to A&E. Not, not BET. We were, uh, I had done Chris Angel at A&E, so we had it in there. And um, we had a business show. We had sort of a, a sort of a Shark Tanky type show. But instead of entrepreneurs, we had ex-contrepreneurs. These were, these were all people that got out of the out of jail or had really hard times and had come up with interesting products. And 50 was going to back them as the magic backer. And so we had pitched that show, but we had also pitched them a... Uh, comedy but a and &E is really not a comedy network and when they ended up passing we took it down the street to to BET mm -hmm. and without 50 in the room they even they bought it off of our our sample um uh what do you call it uh teaser we, we had little scene teasers that we did some of them were funny as heck we did a mm -hmm. hidden camera thing where um uh 50s dating my mom so unbe <laughs> unbe unbeknownst to these young people, they were, they were, you know, old enough to be on camera, but we didn't tell them the mothers who were married, who, you know, out of the blue were sitting their sons down and saying, I got something to tell you. <laughs> oh boy. And, and they said, what's that? And he goes, well, I've been seeing someone. And the kid's like, well, what about dad? And the mom's <laughs> like, well, what about him? <laughs> you know? And she says, well, well, who is he? He says, well, he's here now. What? You know? He goes, Curtis, because 50's real name is Curtis. And she goes, oh, Curtis. And 50 walks out in like a smoking jacket, like a robe and a, you know, slippers. <laughs> and the kid looks up at him and he goes, do I know you? <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and that sold BET on saying, you know, we should try this. So they actually ordered 24 of them, which is unusual. Normally, orders are much, much smaller. But mm -hmm. 50 had promised to bring the entire, every major Academy Award winner he'd ever worked with was going to be on this show. Not the case. But um, 
so we produced them all, but uh, 12 of them ended up going to digital and uh, it was not a, it wasn't the audience. I mean, BET's audience and demographic, they were hoping to lower it, widen it, but it, it didn't, it didn't do it. However, don't worry for 50. He, he's turned his power franchise into really one of the most successful TV franchises ever done. And mm. um, basically owns Stars and Lionsgate. And he's got shows that spawn other series. So it's they just keep coming. Power is the name of the first one. But now he's got Kanan and uh, Black Family Mafia. And he's, he's really done amazing. Um, he's, he, pretty soon he's going to go up from 50 Cent to like, you know, $50 million cent. <laughs> Actually, I think his deal was $150 million. That's a lot of cents. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so a lot of credit to him. I mean, all these guys should be share something in common. I mean, 50 and, and Chris Angel and Bon Jovi, they're extremely hard workers. They are determined. They're going to get to the top. They're going to beat their competition. They're going to make more money than you. And they're more talented than you, and they know it. And they're going to do whatever it takes. And... And that's what it takes sometimes to get there, you know. Mm -hmm. But I have tremendous respect for them all. Tremendous respect. Mm -hmm. Now, I've worked for some people that, you know, you could disrespect. But, mm -hmm. but we're not going to talk about them. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. You know, there's something good to say, don't say it. Good rule for this biz. <laughs> I'm leaning that way also because uh, then you just regret it and it's all a lot of hearsay. Yeah, so I just don't, I, I like, don't like to speak ill of anybody anymore. Nope. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's not worth it. It's so yeah. not worth it. And, okay. just, and like I said, you know, you hear stuff back about yourself and you go, what? <laughs> <laughs> then what? <laughs> but, you know, these experiences, which were great, is that, you know, it really got me to go all over the place, like to China and to, you know, Burma and places that you don't normally go if you're working in Burbank on a, on a single TV series. So mm -hmm. for me, it combined a love of travel, a love of other cultures, a love of new experiences new food new smell new taste you know just I, I like that type of challenge some people don't you know they want to be a little bit more and now we're going here <laughs> did you have a mentor uh, michael I had a few fortunately yeah. thank yeah. thank thank god i can't say that i had anybody that took me under their wing that made it for me but i've had people that have imparted incredible lessons and our teachers are so invaluable yeah. I mean, I was so fortunate to have uh, a high school teacher that took an interest in me and really uh, encouraged my writing, encouraged my music, encouraged me to be creative. And, and that helps so much in your formative years to have somebody to be positive and uh, uh, help steer you in the right direction. And in those days also, you know, reading was so critical and to get people to give you their best books and what to look for in them, you know, was a huge part of the education as well. And appreciate good writing, good story, um, and armchair travel, and and really learn how to think outside the box that your box came in. Mm -hmm. You know, don't accept everything just as it is. And that's why these assignments for me are so exciting. I mean, the, you know, Chris Angel's assignment was like, how do you reinvent magic? It's a five thousand year old art form that um, you know is now rabbits and hats and wands and you know, wizard hats or, or top hats and tuxedos and it was tired and old and it needed to be reinvented and, you know, there wasn't a rock and roll magician and the bad boy Mick Jagger of magic and we go, oh, there's a space, you know, there's an opening. Uh, Copperfield's yeah. retiring and Siegfried and Roy got eaten and by tigers and <laughs> there, was a, there's, there was a headline slot open in Vegas and we damn straight he was going to fill it. Um, mm. and David Blaine was not a, uh, uh, that kind of stage performer. He wasn't going to do a, you know, a big Vegas spectacular show with, mm. uh, is that your God, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, but Chris could. And so changing the visuals, changing the outfits, changing the whole look of a magician, mm. that became the challenge, the music. And, um, that was cool, you know, reinvent magic. What a neat, what a neat assignment. Sure, you're talking about you did Mind Freak for A and E with Chris Angel, yes. um, and it was so successful. Um, and I, that, I wanted to ask you a little bit about that in terms of the creative process. Well, let me let me compound my question. Let me first ask you what the creative process looks like for you in general, 
Um, yes, so <laughs> it's different every time, right? In, in a way, I mean, the in some ways, you know, creativity is an interesting thing uh, as an entity. You know, like what is creativity? What does that mean? You know, scientists can be very creative. You can be a creative computer programmer. You know, some Agreed. people write novels. Some people write programs. You know, it's uh, uh, you know, what exactly is creativity? Where does it come from? How do you harness it? You know, um, that's some people, you know, they're, they're so creative. Well, is that because they're, they're dressed like, you know, boy George, or is that because, you know, they really have a talent, you know, um, uh, are they really artistic? And, and so you approach everything differently. Like in Chris Angel's case, there was a certain amount, he had developed his persona, you know, he, he came in an entity. We weren't inventing him from nothing. He already had a million fans. He was going to be a, uh, wanted to be a rock star. He had a, a band called Angel Dust and they did magic and rock and roll together. So this was his fantasy, you know, and it was how to achieve this man's, you know, vision, so to speak. But he also had, uh, we, we kind of reverse engineered it. What are the 10 most drop dead moments that we can create on TV with his illusions? And those became our A illusions and that's what you stayed through the show to get to the end to, and then how many little gags and bits can we do leading up to it? And then what are the other fill-in stories? His romantic life, his family life, uh, his associates, you know, all these different things that we wove sort of a, um, you know, reality soap opera around a magician who is doing incredible stunts and, and endurance. And that one show, we got to work with Pyro and, um, underwater and international. We went down to Mexico and we worked with wild animals from elephants and snakes and poisonous insects. I mean, this one show, you had to do like 10 other types of series to produce this one series. We're doing aerial and, and I got helicopters and explosions and, you know, there's so much that went into it that would normally be just one specialty in another, in another realm. So it, uh, it was a very ambitious series and it went like six seasons. I was on the first three, uh, incepting it. And, um, uh, and now he's, you know, he's got his headline show in Vegas, which, you know, obviously COVID has affected that, but that was his dream to be the headliner in Vegas. And by golly, he got there. So. Um, I, I was going to suggest, I, I run, I run a, uh, one of my businesses, I run a shoe shine business. What do you really? Like? Yes, I do. And we've worked in Vegas. We've worked all over the country. We've worked in London. <laughs> Interesting. I would have wanted to talk to you because I'm really a serial entrepreneur. I mean, my, I have a lot of interest outside of just television. I, I jumped on the web bandwagon early. I was mm. on the, definitely on the right track, but you have to be on the right train to make it. Yes. Um, I had invented something called Mind Pops long before com.com came along but they got funded first. And now, you know, you've seen the com.com ads. Mm. Um, I had one that was also based on, in essence, shoe shine stands for Vegas. And it was called Soul Revival, uh, S-O-L-E. And the idea was, and I had been through in Asia, they had a lot of reflexology places, very, very, very uh, popular, is mm. that they believe all your nerve endings uh, are at the bottom of your feet. So they believe in, in Asian cultures that you can actually cure something in your kidney, your liver, your brain, your thyroid mm. by acupressure in the right places mm. on your feet. Now, yes. I had been in Vegas long enough to hear at every convention and every nightclub at about one o'clock in the morning or two in the morning, these poor women come out of the nightclub from dancing. The first thing they do is take off their heels and complain how much their feet hurt. Yes. And in Vegas, you got to walk so far between the conventions, the guys, and the same thing. And so we were going to try to see if we could put a uh, shoe shine stand operation in every hotel by every club at the mm -hmm. end of the night called Soul Revival that were foot massages stations. Okay. And thought that would be a great idea. Then we ran into uh, health department issues, and you had to have water nearby, even though we had antiseptic wipes and stuff like that gloves and you know, this is before COVID even this is just for touching feet but um we ran into, they had to have running water and that became an issue with renting the space to put those kiosks up 
if mm. that made sense, because you had to be near a, near a water source. Um, mm. So anyway, I could relate to that business, and, and I have a whole bunch of shoes that need shining, so send me an address. I'll do them all for you. I'll do them all for you. We, we did different. We, we actually put shoe shine chairs in your exhibit booth, yeah. and we find your pitch down to eight to ten seconds. Yeah. Prospect everybody walking by, and if they qualify for the, sh for the uh, products, we invite them in for a free shoe shine. Mm -hmm. There's a pre-qualified sale in the chair. That's the pitch. Everybody <laughs> needs a free shoe shine, you know? <laughs> it's interesting. I mean, businesses are changing, and everybody's sort of an entrepreneur now, and you have access to publicize your stuff that you never had before with the web. So mm. it's interesting. I was watching Steve Van Zanta, who's, you know, Bruce Springsteen's legendary guitarist, been on The Sopranos, and he runs a sort of a new artist site. And um, I think Bill Maher made the comment and he said, there's now 1.5 million people calling themselves artists. He said, they can't all be artists, can they? And Steve Van Zandt said, no, most of them are shit. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> but but everybody has access to now call themselves an artist and put it up on the web and you know you can self-publish your book and, and you're an author now and the mm. the whole filtering process the whole curating process has changed in some ways it's democratized but but the competition then is so much higher and breaking through the clutter is so much harder you mm. know before they told us what to watch we grew up with what three channels to choose from three All right you know? ABC, NBC, CBS. <laughs> yeah, and they and they weren't happy when they invented the remote, you know, because you could change the channel. They liked it better when you had to sit there and watch them, and didn't want to <laughs> get up, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so we've watched a lot of changes in that area, and uh, and continue to, as we get into AI, because that's some of the areas I'm looking at. Is you know mm. what's happening with augmented reality, virtual reality, um, mm. maybe holographic entertainment. Um, I mean, this is all where the future is going. So mm. it's weird. I went to the, I went to an advanced screening of the Bond premiere in one of the most, probably one of the newest fully equipped theaters. The Motion Picture Academy opened up a museum here in LA. We now have a motion picture and TV museum and it's mm -hmm. got a state of the art screening room, state of the art. There were more speakers there than I've ever seen. I mean, there must've been a hundred different speakers. I'm like, how do you mix for this? And it sounded <laughs> great. But the weird thing is Bond was such an old franchise. It was watching this very dated type of film, you know, it's, it's the same music from 30 years ago. And, and, mm -hmm. and Daniel Craig was old enough to be the grandfather of the female lead that he's with, you know. <laughs> um, it was kind of a weird dichotomy because you're in this most modern thing showing this film, but it mm -hmm. just seemed very, the film itself, uh, even though it had modern effects, became a dated concept. Mm. And uh, I thought that was kind of interesting as well. You know, that is actually the highest grossing film franchise. You know, people normally think it's Star Wars or something that uh, uh, really was the most valuable franchise. Bond is at over 30 something films. Wow. A lot of films. Oh, wow. When you think about it, and a lot of theme songs. If you mm. get down to, you know, the top 10 Bond theme songs were all top 10 hits. Mm. And they had Billie Eilish do this one. And I was like, I've heard all those great old Bond theme songs. To me, sorry. She's just the flavor of the month. And they stuck her in there. It wasn't like a great theme song. Not to be mm -hmm. critical, but as a musician, I can tell you, it's nothing I came out remembering. You know, it's just Billie Eilish. <laughs> they're, doing a sequel, they're doing a sequel to E.T. Uh, you mean the uh, extraterrestrials coming back? No, ETC. ETC. <laughs> okay. <laughs> gotcha. I was thinking ET e the extraterrestrial. <laughs> now I have to warn you. <laughs> Seamus has a series of very bad jokes. Okay. You cannot encourage it or let him get started because they don't get any better. Do not be optimistic, Michael. They do not get better. <laughs> All right. We're, we're, we're not taking our comedy on the road at this point. So <laughs> maybe, maybe eventually, you know, I'm sure we could write something pugilistically. Theme, <laughs> you know, something like that. But I, I, you know, I thought it was interesting your question about what is creativity and how do you harness it. I mean, I notice in myself that um, I'm a night guy. I, I, I work best at night. I'll work all night long. I don't mind doing all nighters when I'm on a roll on a script or putting together a presentation deck or editing something or um, 
you know, I, I can go all night and it's just flowing. It's great. If you woke me up in the morning and said, be creative, I might be like, uh, talk to me in a few hours. You know, I know yeah. my, I know my peak hours of creativity. I know that, um, when I'm playing music and I've always been fascinated by the songwriters process and I've watched all the interviews between Elton and Bernie Taupin and Billy Joel and, uh, you know, uh, how do these people write? Do you write the words first? What comes to you? Is it the words or the music? You know, in mm -hmm. my case, I find I, I'll get lost in music and it just comes out of my hands. I don't know where it comes from. And sometimes the music will sing the words to me. Other times I'll hear a phrase and go, oh, that would make a great catchphrase for a song. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I remember breaking up with a girlfriend and looking and saying, you know, we both want what we could have had. And I thought, oh, that's a title. <laughs> and I went and wrote that. And I went and wrote that song, you know. Or things happen to you around you, and you react to them. And uh, I was in college, and I befriended this young girl, and she attempted suicide. And mm -hmm. I was mad about it. And I remember writing a song called "Suicide Only Works Once," mm -hmm. you know. And it just you get um, your creativity becomes ignited almost. Mm -hmm. It's like it's like the like the flint on a Bic lighter. You know, the, the creative is already in there. All the fluid is in there. You already have it in. It's just you spark it so that it can come out as a flame. Oh. And some people are good at controlling and are able to channel when that happens. And other people, it's just, it just happens and then it goes away. And you mm -hmm. hear about, you know, I, I can't write anymore. I'm having a blackout, a dead spot. I got to, you know, change my environment and, and come up with something. Um, it's also changed because people used to write just for passion. It wasn't mm. an industry. Don't forget, nobody was getting rich off rock and roll in 1948. Yeah. You know, suddenly you have this new new whole industry that evolves. And now it's not about writing because you're feeling as an artist. Now you're writing because the record company needs another hit on album two. Uh -huh. and today it's getting worse because today now it's not actually the artists and the creatives that are driving the industry it is the mba bean counters and their computer algorithms and they can tell you what icon is going to be the next thing this is why so many movies come out where they're the same theme like yeah. they will literally use algorithms that scan um uh for example uh, web searches and let's say um suddenly everyone's searching for mermaids like mm. oh mermaid projects are going to be big mm. And then they go, well, this, how does that test against sirens? Because mermaids are a younger audience, but sirens are slightly older mermaids, you know? Mm -hmm. And they run it through AI, and literally they're, they're telling the writer and the director, what? oh, no, you got to change it to sirens. Yes. Well, who's making the decision here? The, the brilliant creative guy or the MBA <laughs> guy from Business and Legal saying, our research shows. Same thing for a song. Yeah. It's all it's all data probability now, but that's not art. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. You, you know, Mona Lisa was not painted by numbers. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how you know. I don't know how Leonardo knew when he was done. He, I'm sure there's an eyebrow thing, an eyelash mm -hmm. on her that he that bugs him to this day. But <laughs> you know, but but the creative process is changing because we're not making. We're not valued, I'm concerned, that, uh, that, you know, art comes out of emotion and experience. Mm -hmm. And now it's being dictated by, well, the data shows. And yeah, make that's the change. an interesting point. Yeah. And, and it's changing what we see and how we see it. And they test the endings and everything is tested. Is yeah. this line right? Is that casting right? Is this person right? And... We're also painting it in by a different set of criteria. Our, our society is so polarized at the moment and, mm -hmm. and not celebrating diversity because they're celebrating diversity in a way that actually makes it worse. Mm -hmm. In other words, they're forcing people into roles and situations that normally you'd say, well, they would never cast that person for that character. That's not believable. Yeah. But we're representing. Yeah. But we got a representational, you know, it's... <laughs> And, and I, I don't think that works. It becomes um, untrue and, and un inauthentic. And yeah. you can tell that they're token characters, mm -hmm. you know? And, and I have no issue. It's not that you're being, you know, racially insensitive or whatnot, but all of a sudden, 
well, let's make them, you know, let's make the next Bond black. Mm. You know, and okay. But really, what's the reason for that exactly? Mm. He wrote it as a British sexist white guy. I mean, why do we have to change it per se? Oh, well, then he should be a gay one. Well, then, then, then what are you going to call him? <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, James. <laughs> it doesn't work. I mean, and I, I just was like, all right, well, we're, we, we live through franchises and, and that one, it'll be interesting because they, they let it, um, without spoiling it, uh, they set it up for there to be a female bond, but in about 10 years. Like in the plot, they actually set it up that that, that Bond uh, has an offspring that will probably spring off in about 20, 29, somewhere in there, after Idris Elba's done being Bond. Then they'll change it to a girl. Do you want to see a girl Bond, or wouldn't that be a different film? Wouldn't that wouldn't that be what is the female assassin one that was so good? There was there's a couple of them, you know. The heat, well, but. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking of the uh, Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie movie, right? They were both assassins. Yeah, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Uh, yeah. That one, yes. Where mm. in the end, they wanted to kill each other, literally. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was an interesting mix of things happening at the same time. I, and I think a lot of that, it was the is the chemistry of the couple. Yes. So I think it was a big draw to that movie. I'm not sure if you had different actors playing it, if it would have had the popularity that it did. I would completely agree with you. It wasn't that great a film, but the fact that you could tell that these two people had a had a thing going on was palpable. And mm-hmm. that's the weird thing about the mystery of love. You don't know. There is a chemical element to it. And, you know, sometimes it shows up on screen with chemistry and sometimes it doesn't. Um, I just watched scenes from a marriage. I thought it was brilliant. I don't know if you saw this. I haven't. You know, they brought back the Ingmar Bergman film and they made a few changes that that I do think were um uh made some sense uh instead of in the original it was the man that was actually the one who was having the infidelity in the new one it's the woman actually that went out Mm -hmm. and was having an affair and that changed the dynamic in this one the woman was actually the bread earner she was making more money than him and he was the one that was sort of the defendant so the modern version was actually an interesting update i thought um and we're very well done some remakes are much better um, I mean, I thought Sabrina was much better in the remake with Harrison Ford than the original Humphrey Bogart movie. I was thinking Greg Kinnear. Was Greg Kinnear in that? Because I worked with Greg Beckett E. Was, was Greg that, Kinnear in that? That's no, Sabrina. I don't think so. Was he? Oh, yes. He was the younger brother. He yeah, played, yeah. Yeah. He played David. Yeah. Sometimes I think it's hard to take a really old film and then compare it to something done in the modern color world. Um, it's sort of an apple and an orange kind of thing to a degree. Um, but I like some of the old films, you know, they hold up some of them. Um, now, have you, have you ever been in a position where, as we were talking, you're talking about, you know, creativity is changing. Uh, it's, we're no longer allowing a certain art forms to just come from the the passion and the brain uh, but rather being dictated have you ever been in that position where you felt that that was just so blatantly happening in a project that you, you had to speak out sure <laughs> all the time you're constantly fighting for your artistic choices that's that's what makes you the artist that you are when you fight for those choices and sometimes you're up against things that you wouldn't believe i mean you know in singapore the government decides what ultimately goes on and they had told me that they wanted a scene on a, uh, at a, what was the equivalent of like union members got their own golf clubs there. And so they would, uh, if you were like a member of the taxi union, you could use a, a, a golf uh, facility. And golf was big in Asia at the time. And they wanted a golf scene, but I didn't have one written in the script that week. Well, unbeknownst to me, they actually took my cast, ordered them to the golf course, shot it, uh, of them swinging on the golf course and in the middle of this sitcom just <laughs> ran that footage out of nowhere <laughs> just to show them at the golf course swinging and then right back into the show. I had nothing to do with the show. <laughs> just cut. And I didn't know it was even coming. The government and I had said, no, don't worry. We'll get it in. We're going to go. We'll write it into a story. We'll do something. Now, now this week, boom. 
So, you know, how am I going to fight that uh, artistically? I can't. They, um, when we did the first uh, uh, premiere episode, I remember, I don't know how they did it or why or what happened. It was a technical glitch, but the first five minutes were in black and white. It was like literally the Wizard of Oz. Oh. The first five minutes of the show aired in black and white for no good reason and suddenly turned to color. I was like, well, I'm in Singapore. I'm not in Kansas anymore. So, yeah, yeah. There are times that you definitely fight for things. I had to mm -hmm. fight for with Chris and, and A&E all the time. Um, he had, when he started, he really wanted to keep one eye covered by his hair and whatnot. I started calling him the Cyclops. And, <laughs> you know, always wearing dark glasses. I'm like, we need you to connect with the audience first. We need your eyes, you know, both of them. And, um, you know, and then he did a thing where he sticks a needle in it and pulls out thread. But, um, yeah. but yeah, we had plenty of artistic, uh, I mean, that's what it's all about. And then it's also, that's part of collaboration when other people with other artistic ideas bounce theirs off yours and then you see what sticks. And uh, if someone in my world, if someone has a better idea, then I'm all for it. And other mm. people, they want to kill you. I mean, yeah, it depends. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I see, Seamus, you were you were jumping up and down a second ago like you wanted to say something. Did you want to? I forget what it was going on there. Uh, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> that's, and that, by the way, is something with creativity, too. You have a flash of brilliance, they call it. You know, it's just a flash. If I don't write it down immediately, I'm doing something else, it's gone. That's a trick for writers, though. I, I mean, I asked people to tell me they're writers, and I said, do you keep a notebook? Oh, what, what do you mean? I'm like, all day long, people are feeding you lines, situations, yes. descriptions. If you're not keeping a notebook, you're losing all your resources of what to, you know, go yeah. back to when we forget things as we get older. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and they go, no, I don't keep a notebook. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I mean, so many people here, you know, they write their, their screenplay. And they're like, I finished my screenplay. Mm. And they actually think that the first draft of their first screenplay <laughs> is going to be the one that propels them to <laughs> fame and fortune. I'm like, you just wrote yourself a 120 page lottery ticket. <laughs> you know, I remember my my first script was really interesting, actually, because I was in college and it was 1981 and I knew that 1984 was coming. And I knew that the teachers in all the schools were going to reassign Orwell's 1984. Mm. And um, I knew that there'd be a tremendous amount of publicity just for it turning 84. Mm. And Jim Cameron had just done, like, I know it was Total Recall, but big sci-fi extravaganzas was big. And I tried to get the rights from the Orwell's estate to remake 1984 and release it midnight of the last minute of 1983 and mm. i could just imagine the trailers 1984 coming soon you know mm. <laughs> and uh i ended up uh writing uh, an adaption uh back in 1981 of 1984 and i remember coming out to hollywood to shop it and i remember the first guy uh that i went to was an agent and he took my script and he put it in his hand and he went like this. He was weighing it. He said, it feels heavy. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning it was already 10 to 20 pages too long. Oh. <laughs> and then he looks at it and there at the time when you get a script, you know, there's those brass things that hold it together through the holes. Yeah. Right, right. The real, back then, you know, we weren't on digital, right? So the PA's job, if they like a script, is to copy it mm -hmm. and to run it through the copier. So um, they don't need the third brad, the middle one in the middle hole. And they know if you submit your script with a brad in the middle hole, mm. you're not in the industry. You don't, you, oh. It's your first time. So <laughs> the first thing, then he goes, and you've got an extra brad here. And he takes it out. Okay? <laughs> right. And he hasn't even looked at my script yet, but it's already too heavy. And I got one hole off, all right? <laughs> so then he goes and he flips through it from the back, all right? And he just flips through the pages. And he's just looking at the Rorschach ink on the page. <laughs> and, he, and he looks at me and he says, you got a lot of text here. <laughs> <There's> <laughs> too many words. He said, you know, he said, film is all about the spaces between the words. 
Hmm. It's the motion picture. He said, hmm. you can already tell just by looking at the patterns of my paragraphs and dialogue hmm. that he would not buy that script. Just looking at the, yeah. at the shapes. Wow. Because when you have to read a hundred of those a week, yeah. you're really good <laughs> at <laughs> throwing the ones out. Wow. Now, I learned a lot of lessons just from that level of rejection. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly <laughs> enough, they did actually make the deal, not with me. There was a guy named Paul Mayersberg and Alan Ladd Jr. It was a famous, Dad was a famous actor, actually played, what was it, the Cowardly Lion in uh, Wizard of Oz? Um, or the Tin Man, one or the other, Alan Ladd. Anyway, uh, Alan Ladd brought the, bought the rights, hired a guy named Paul Mayersberg to write it. And Paul Mayersberg had written something uh, with Buck Henry that I loved, which was The Man Who Fell to Earth uh, with David Bowie, cult film, sci-fi. And they got him to do 1984. It didn't get released till a year later, till 85, which blew the release date. It's, it was Richard Burton's last film. And it was with John Hurd. And it was horrible. Like, wow. really, really wow. Like, oh, they should have bought my big extravaganza <laughs> sci-fi. I'm thinking back to my script going, you know, <laughs> all that description was all the cool stuff that this film didn't have. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's a, luck is when, you know, what is it? They say luck is when uh, timing meets preparation or opportunity mm -hmm. meets preparation. Absolutely. Wasn't my turn. Mm -hmm. Well, and can we talk a little bit about you? I think you work with Seth MacFarlane uh, for yeah. Epics. Again, a project, a multi-talented guy who makes enough money to then indulge his true passion. And Seth MacFarlane's true passion was to sing like Frank Sinatra. Wow. And he went as far as to hire all of the oldsters that had played with Sinatra that were still living to mm. form an orchestra, a band, and play all of these incredible um, standards that Sinatra never got around to recording, but probably would have had he been younger and alive today, he would have done these tunes. And um, Seth had, uh, at the time, they didn't know, didn't know her as well, but Sarah Bareilles was on the show. Oh. Um, yeah, she was wonderful. And he did duets with her. And Sinatra uh, is one of his original arrangers conducted the band and uh, we took over the Nokia theater and recorded a two hour concert special live. That was really a passion project of Seth's. And, you know, you can imagine that he's in this happy place and we're all in a happy place. I mean, it's just incredible music and uh, keeping these standards alive for the next generation because he's got so many younger fans. Uh, you know, this was my parents' generation and grandparents' generation of music and it still holds up. And, um, but we were creating his passion project and what a joy, you know, what a joy to do. Mm -hmm. that, seems, that seems like it would have been a, a, a real pleasure to be a part of something. I think when, and Seamus always talks about when people are excited about what they do, it really comes through uh, right. and it makes them a joy to be around. So I would, it sounds like yeah, I'm getting that vibe, like it truly was that, that, yeah. that creative joy. Yeah, it is. And not his day job. As a matter of fact, you know, someone said, you know, he, he's not the singing guy, you know, <laughs> the family guy, you know, um, but he got to do what he loves and, and still does it. I mean, you know, to this day, the other fun thing is we actually recorded. This was a joy for me. I had always wanted to be go to the Capitol Records, famous Capitol Records building, oh, in yeah. Hollywood. And I, frankly, I'd never had an occasion to actually get in there. And we recorded in Studio A. Of Capitol Records. And wow. as a musician, all right, yeah, you, wow is right. Because if you're a musician, you realize that that is where Judy Garland sang Somewhere Over the Rainbow, where Sinatra sang My Way. In Studio B, Nat King Cole had his piano in there. Um, Streisand, I mean, the, the Beatles. I'm at the urinal thinking, did John Lennon go here? <laughs> I mean, you're, you're, you're in such a musically historic place that if Walls could sing, you're, mm. you're, you're literally on holy ground of, of the greatest recordings in the world. And that's where Seth chose to record is where Sinatra did it. 
And the famous mic, the Neumann 57 that Sinatra used, Frank's mic, was dedicated to the Smithsonian. So everybody thinks that Frank's mic is in the Smithsonian and the press put out that Seth MacFarlane to, for the authenticity of this project was using Frank's studio and Frank's mic as if he had gotten it back from the Smithsonian. What you end up finding out when you go to Capitol Records is that there is a cabinet and there's a lock shelf and in it are seven boxes that say Frank's mic. <laughs> <laughs> and we got to use one of those. Wow. Um, yeah, it was really, it, it was, it was definitely uh, a lot of fun and uh, a joyful project. And, you know, for the people that saw it, it played on Epix. E-P-I-X was the outlet that, that aired that. So that was good. We've got another catchphrase, if walls could sing, huh? If walls could sing, that would be the room <laughs> to be in. Let me tell you, I... I took pictures of me in there. It was somewhere I'd always wanted to, you know, and you close your eyes and you'd feel something. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm not a wooey paranormally kind of guy, but you know, we're all energy. We all come from energy. So rooms yeah. can have energy, buildings can have energy. The rocks that I touched in Jerusalem, 5,000 years of history, they vibrate. You can mm -hmm. feel it, you know, if you're attuned. Totally. Totally. And that was true for there, you know, yeah. it was, you, you could feel the greatness that had gone through. It's yeah. hard not to feel creative there, you know? It's hard not to feel great listening to you. you you're, you're attaching us and bringing us right back and, and into this genre and, and your experiences. And it's, it's fascinating. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure to share with you all. And if I can inspire any other artists out there to, you know, go with your passion and, and there's, there's, there's no mistakes, you know? Mm -hmm. you, there's only rewrites. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, so there's that. Well, before we let you go, if we could just sneak in one more project, because I know we're coming very close to perilously close, but could you talk just even a second about uh, American Hustlers for A&A? Um, it ended up being done, I believe, with um, one of the cubes. There's Ice Cube. There's How many cubes are there? Uh, iced tea. No, it wasn't a cube. It was either ice cube or iced tea. And one of the ices uh, ended up doing it. But the, the, the concept really was that um, uh, uh, 50 was going to be like this angel investor and people that came from hard luck stories that had tried to better themselves through um, coming up with a product or a service were coming to 50 to prove that why they should be given his seed money. And some of them were interesting. We had one guy come in and he had um, caffeinated toothpaste. Before you even have your coffee, we get you up and going <laughs> in the morning. <laughs> Put the zest back in zest. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, okay, all right, that was different. <laughs> you know? Right on your teeth. <laughs> so, so it was sort of like, you know, it was like Shark Tank, but for ex entrepreneurs. <laughs> yes. So, uh, it didn't 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 go. We did a pilot and and they didn't air it, but ended up a show very 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 similar, which is what ended up happening with these type of ideas. You always see them later, and they're not yours anymore. Um, but they did do something like that with I think I see uh, where he was like a mentor slash investor. And do you have a favorite project of any of the projects you've ever done? It's always the next one. The next one, I like that. Always the next one, yeah. right? Yeah, they're all favorites. They're all your babies, and mm. but the one that you're working on next is, you know, I'm working on one right now that I think is going to be pretty cool. Where I'm, I'm, I, you know, in the same way that Magic had a slot open, uh, there wasn't a face on the face of Magic after Copperfield, so to speak. Mm. Um, uh, I got involved with uh, uh, an astrologer. Hmm. And I realized that astrology is people are more superstitious around the world than ever. They're more, everybody knows their sign. A lot of people identify with it. It's been part of dating, um, but there's no face on it. If I ask you, who's the most famous astrologer you've ever heard of? Yeah, I have nothing. <laughs> nothing. But it's a $2 billion industry that people check in with almost every day. Hmm. And so I've re I've taken that same idea that we did with magic of how do we, 
reinvent magic and take an old, old art form, an old thing, and how do you make that new again? And magic, at least, is visual. You can do tricks and demonstrations. Astrology is not known for the visuals. It's somebody doing a reading. And how do you know if it's true? You got to wait months to find out if it, if it came true. So you don't see a lot of like hit astrology shows. And that's different than psychics, by the way. Astrologers are psychics with charts. Mm. Um, and it's not that I believe in it so much as personally. I don't need to. I believe in it as a market segment, an entertainment uh, business, mm. uh, something looking for a celebrity face to head it. And I'm creating that. And I'm mm -hmm. redoing all the visuals, all the music, all the language of astrology, all the mm -hmm. symbols, and and um, mel melding it with different ones from Chinese to Indian, from making it global. It's not just uh, the American version. And then uh, relating it to all of the other metaphysical areas from near-death experiences and past life regressions. And you know, I'm staying away from the spammy, uh, scam, psychic -y world i'm getting more into the um things that are possible but we can't prove world um and so it's been an exciting project you know to create a chris angel of astrology and mm. you'll know and you'll know if i'm successful when <laughs> kyle thomas astrology.com becomes a household name so <laughs> kyle kyle a-y-l-e thomas t-h-o-m-a-s astrology so Love We'll put up the link. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the 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 link is there to show he is. A lot of press and whatnot. We've got some exciting things coming up where he's going to uh, start writing regularly for the largest market in the United States and one of the six largest media publications uh, in the nation. And he'll be a regular contributor, and pretty soon on his way to a household name. Just hoping my name's on the uh, the TV series, the hit TV series. By that, I hope. I have a line for the first astrologer that he, he can say, or they can say, write down a number. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, I, I mean, I always say that about psychics. I worked with one of the greatest uh, uh, mentalists in the world, a guy named Banachek, who also has a show in Vegas. If you're going to Vegas, go see Banachek's show. Um, he's amazing. And uh, uh, he was part of uh, the Alpha Project that fooled the scientists. Uh, the amazing Randy put up a million dollars to any psychic that could prove psychic works, that it's real. Mm -hmm. And then these guys uh, then turned around and went to the uh, government and the government funded a study to see if it was real. And these two guys, Banachek and Amazing Randy, stumped the scientists. They came out saying, yes, mentalism and psychic uh, ability is real. Wow. And they know it's not. Because if it because if it were real, you and I would have the Powerball from last night. Yes, seven hundred million dollars. If, if, uh, if it were real, all those poor people on September tenth would have canceled their uh, flights. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you're a psychic and it's real, no. Nah. But they 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 convinced the government, which is a little scary. Wow. So I got I had a show working with him as well. So that's another one coming up. Mm. Well. I know we're out of time, um, okay. but I, we could go on and on, I think, talking about the exciting career you've had. I hope mm. that you'll come back, you know, uh, especially as your project's developing, that you'll continue to come back and talk to us. Sure. No reason <laughs> not to. We had a project for you guys where we were very interested when you had the, the inn with the presidents. Oh, uh, yeah. That if was you remember, we had a, we, I had a bunch of chefs that were elevated above five-star restaurants. They're the ones who literally cook for potentates and royal families and kings. And we had a thing called Cooking for Kings. And, wow. we, had, and we had a bit where we wanted to go to your um, facility and uh, your chef that had been a White House chef. We wanted to recreate famous dinners through history. That's right. Like, like what That's did they right. eat at the Peace Treaty of Versailles? You know, what did they eat at... After they signed the declaration, where did they go for fish and chips? You know, it was just, <laughs> it, just it was a historic food show that was going to be very cool. Mm. I'm sorry we didn't get to do it with you, but it, it would have been good. I'm sorry, too. I hope we can work together on something else, though. Well, you're an attorney, right? 
I, I am an attorney, well, actually, Professor. They always work on something. <laughs> There's always a need for an attorney. <laughs> well, <days. laughs> I'm still, you know what? <laughs> I, I always say that there's a lot of stuff rattling around in my head. I did matrimonial law for the majority oh, of the year. Okay. I Got say it. it's just there's just stuff that you, you can, no one would believe. Uh, and I, I needed you once. I'm glad I don't need you for that now. But fortunately, I think I don't know how many minutes we've been on, but I, I'm not going to get a bill in 15 minute increments for this, am I? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I mean, you guys have it down that you get paid for your phone calls. If I got paid for the amount of phone calls that I have to deal with, oh my God, I'd be retired. But Mike, <laughs> Now free shoe shines. Free shoe shines. I ended free shoe shine. Do I get a foot rub though? Do I get a good <laughs> reflexology session out of it while you're doing my while you're doing my shoes? <laughs> oh boy, we're just evolving. We're evolving. We're spiraling okay. a little here. <laughs> All right, never mind. <laughs> Pleasure to be with you. I'll let you sign out. You got a switch behind you. You can just hit the switch. Just take your your arm up and go like this. Here. Boom. <laughs> yeah. Go to black. Go. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. We're going to say goodbye from everyone here. At, it may interest you to know.